Funerals are sad truth of human life. They're always somber occasions, memorable for all the worst reasons that surround loss. But, sometimes, you've got some strange stories to go along with them. And for this episode, we are taking a look at some of the biggest funerals in all of history. The funerals with the highest number of people physically there to see the funeral or the funeral procession. And this includes a Guinness World Record holder too, which boasts an impressively large stat. In 1983, upon returning to the Philippines from America, Senator Benigno Aquino Jr. was assassinated, shot behind the left ear after he'd just set foot on the tarmac at the Manila airport. Suddenly, the opposition party had lost their leader, and the view of President Ferdinand E. Marcos, Aquino's longtime enemy, soured further as suspicion spread. The New York Times reported that on the night of the funeral, some hundreds of students rushed to the Capitol in frustration, throwing rocks and crude bombs, only to be fought off by police. That wasn't the scene everywhere, though. Far from it. The funeral itself took place after a procession that lasted over 10 hours and wound across a 19-mile route on the outskirts of Manila. Somewhere between 1 and 2 million people lined that procession route, occasionally getting a little rowdy and trying to force themselves past police lines. Some held signs that called out and vilified Marcos and the government, wanting justice for Aquino. For the most part, the procession was completely peaceful, largely devoid of political messages, grief, or anger. There was singing and cheering as his coffin passed. On the whole, it was a really positive celebration of the man who personified the Filipino's courage in the face of oppression. Gandhi really doesn't need much of an introduction. As the man largely credited with Indian independence from Britain, Gandhi is among some of the most important political leaders of the 20th century. And so when he was suddenly assassinated in 1948 by a Hindu fanatic, the nation was shocked. Shortly after, Gandhi's body was placed in a mansion called Birla House, where people could pass through and pay homage. And thousands of people lined up and waited through the night to be able to do just that. But that didn't really make the shock go away. The procession route was about five miles long and lasted for around five hours, with one or two million people lining the streets, so densely packed that in photos, you can't see the ground between all of the mourners. And, unlike some other large funerals, this seemed to be a quietly somber affair. All of those people walked along the procession, alongside their beloved leader, silently crying, no one complaining about the walk or leaving part way through. The heavy melancholy really seems to be the main feeling here, so impactful that even looking at pictures decades later could bring back that deathly silence mode. Despite a humble birth, Arthur Wellesley, the first Duke of Wellington, rose to become one of the most prominent military leaders of his time. Fighting in the Napoleonic Wars and winning against steep odds, he really distinguished himself as a hero by being one of the leading figures in Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. His reputation upon returning to England was much less impressive though, as he cared little for the plight of the poor in newly industrialized Victorian England. Nonetheless, his funeral in 1852 was a spectacle the level of which had never been seen before. Huge and ridiculously opulent funerals were a thing in England at the time, regardless of social status, and Wellesley's funeral was the pinnacle of that. Tens of thousands of pounds went into an 11-ton bronze funeral car with lavish decorations, thousands of newly installed lights, a Roman funeral arch for the procession to pass under, and merchandise. About 1.5 million people arrived to watch the miles-long procession, bearing the dreary and stormy weather for a few hours, and despite the lavishness, the entire affair was really pretty solemn and orderly. Shortly after India gained its independence from Britain, Jawaharlal Nehru, already a politician who had advocated for independence, was elected as the first Prime Minister of India. He won the respect of many Indians and world leaders alike, implementing a lot of social reforms to better the lives of women and children, while also advocating further advancement in industrial, scientific, and technological fields. Unfortunately, Cold War conflicts took a toll on his health, and led to his death in 1964. To witness his last rites, about 1.5 million mourners came out in droves along the six-mile procession route. Officials and dignitaries, both domestic and foreign, were in attendance, and the whole thing was just a pretty somber affair. Nehru had already been suffering health problems, and so his death didn't come as much of a surprise, while also happening at a time when India was experiencing a period of relative stability. And so the funeral seemed to fit that. Mournful, but accepting and generally quiet. 
In the world of Indian politics, Bal Thackeray was a controversial figure. The founder of the Shiv Sena party, and the one who was largely responsible for its prominence as a Hindu nationalist movement. But his followers absolutely loved him. And that meant when the news of his death came out in 2012, they refused to believe it. Eventually though, reality and mourning set in. When it came to the funeral, somewhere around 2 million people were expected, and the guest turned out not to be that far off. Indian media reported that about 1.5 million people did fill the streets and crowd close together, a dense sea of humanity surrounding the car that carried his body through the city. Following the split that created the two countries of North and South Korea, times were tough. Most of the country's industry was in the area that became North Korea, leaving South Korea an underwhelming and largely agricultural nation. But under President Park Chung-hee, the country blossomed, rising out of poverty and becoming a respectable industrial power. Well respected by foreign powers, his death came as a shock, the result of a sudden assassination in 1979. A week of official mourning was announced, and a third of the country spent that week burning incense and paying their respects. After that week came the funeral, attended by dignitaries and representatives from 41 different countries. The procession itself lasted about six hours and wound through the streets of Seoul, the closed casket adorned with flowers and easily visible to those who attended. An estimated two million people lined the foggy streets to say their last goodbyes, weeping as the procession passed by. Originally enlisted as a soldier in Pakistan's army, Ziaur Rahman was the principal leader in the uprising that led to Bangladesh's independence from Pakistan. Upon returning home and through a series of coups, Rahman became the president of Bangladesh, and a popular president, despite being generally classified as authoritarian. He died pretty young though, the result of an assassination in 1981 by a resentful rebel commander who was acting on personal, rather than political motives. People at the time feared what his death would mean for the future in terms of the old political feuds it could reopen, or the continuation of the slow but steady economic progress that the country had been seeing. But aside from the political ramifications, the people also mourned, and media agencies reported nearly two million people gathering in the capital. The gathering here wasn't calm though, with some of Rahman's supporters fighting against the procession and tried to take the coffin away. Hugo Chavez was a controversial figure, to put it lightly. He was pretty divisive, heavily vilified as a dictator for his socialist revolution in Venezuela. At the same time though, during his 14 years as the leader of Venezuela, a lot of the poor really praised him for working toward Latin American unity and funding social projects. All that praise and love from the people was pretty clearly on display when it came to his funeral in 2013, where his coffin was presented with the sword of Simón Bolívar. His body was left in state to be viewed by any who wanted to pay their respects, and the people answered. Two million of them filing by, sometimes after waiting for up to 26 hours for the opportunity. Some mourners sobbed at seeing him and didn't know how to express their sorrow, feeling that they owed everything that they had to him. Others remembered his political victories, calling him invincible and undefeated. The outpouring of emotion after Chavez's death is hard to dispute, and people wanted him eventually interred alongside Simón Bolívar himself. Victor Hugo was the hero of the working class. His writings embodied the revolutionary spirit with stories of heroism and humanity, inspiring the poor and oppressed. So, fittingly, when he died in May 1885, he'd requested a poor man's funeral. But that didn't happen. The French government knew his death would draw crowds and prepared accordingly, placing his body under the Arc de Triomphe, on a raised platform almost half the height of the arch itself. Electric lights, torches, funeral urns, and street lamps lit with green flames sat at the base. The government was right to set up such a spectacle, because over two million people showed up, which was more than the entire population of Paris at the time. So there wasn't a single empty chair or empty table, with people flooding the streets at midnight and camping out. In the end, it became a big party, crowds made up of workers and the poor drinking and singing through the night, their cups always kept full thanks to the wine shops that stayed open, or the waiters walking the streets with more drinks. Those same people climbed trees and buildings to get a better view of the five-mile-long procession, filled with everything from suffragettes to gymnasts. Originally a revolutionary who took part in the 1979 revolution in Iran, Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani later went a very different route, far from his revolutionary origins. 
Instead, he advocated better relations with the West and served as a voice for the younger generations and middle class, seemingly the only person in government to do. At his state funeral in 2017 though, the government wanted to highlight his revolutionary past and brush off his reformist later life. But when some 2.5 million people arrived for his funeral, his supporters made their views clear. Protesters gathered in front of the University of Tehran, yelling and drowning out the government officials by shouting opposition slogans, loud enough that officials had to raise the volume of the loudspeakers and audio engineers tried to mess with the sound to try and hide the voices of the protesters. Not that they were met with much success on that front. Even his political opponents were vocal in their sadness over his death. The people who attended the funeral fell all across the political spectrum. And the White House also sent condolences, which was completely unprecedented and unexpected, considering ties between Iran and the U.S. had been severed for nearly 40 years. The wife of Argentinian President Juan Perón, Eva Perón had always wanted to make something of herself. Using her power, she championed social issues by helping the poor and needy, building hospitals, and getting women the right to vote. Her supporters absolutely loved her, seeing Evita as the closest thing they had to a saint. So when she died in July 1952 at just 33 years old, the entire country mourned. Her body was later put on display and during those two weeks, some 3 million people waited in up to 15-hour-long lines to file past and pay their respects. Tens of thousands passed by every day, kissing the glass cover, fainting, and weeping, with nurses constantly on standby in case anyone needed medical assistance. Once those two weeks were up, the day of her funeral procession arrived, her body loaded onto a specially made gun carriage while two million people lined the streets, flowers being thrown down from balconies overhead while Air Force planes flew above. Her body wasn't immediately buried though, and instead went on a weird trip around the world before she was eventually brought back to Argentina in 1974, over two decades later. Anyone who knows racing, has probably heard Ayrton Senna's name. Not only the best of his generation, but also a legend in the sport who's widely considered to be one of the best of all time. But a tragic figure too, dying in 1994 in a brutal crash that was televised around the world. His death hit the racing community, and his home country of Brazil hard. The Brazilian government declared three days of national mourning, and when Senna's body was flown back home, at least a million people were waiting at the airport. The procession wove through the city as three million people lined the streets to watch and grief. Once that procession came to a stop, the people formed a line three miles long to be able to pay their respects. One of the few on this list who wasn't some sort of political leader, Um Kultum was a singer and artist beloved in a way that is pretty much unmatched in the Western world. Hailed as the Star of the East, and Egypt's Fourth Pyramid, Kultum was one of the most famous singers of her time. But she was more than just a popular singer. She rejected the social norms of the period and managed to appeal to anyone, regardless of their status. At the same time, she embodied and supported a pan-Arab unity, bringing people together so well that the president at the time would deliver speeches right after her televised concerts. Just about everyone loved her, so when she died in 1975, about 4 million people arrived to pay their respects. The procession route was planned long in advance, and traffic shut down hours before it started. But those plans ultimately didn't really matter, with media agencies reporting that mourners broke through the police lines to gather behind the coffin, chanting farewell to the lady. And the derivation from the plans went way further than that, the officials actually giving up power in the procession to the people themselves, who took the coffin and carried it along their own route before her body was delivered to the cemetery for burial. Considering how widespread religion is in society in general, is it really surprising that, eventually, a pope would end up on this list? In this case, that's Pope John Paul II. The funeral took place in 2005 and pulled in millions of people from around the world. In the days leading up to the funeral, two million pilgrims filed through St. Peter's Basilica to view the pope's body. Then, when the funeral itself came, four million pilgrims flooded into Rome, about doubling the city's population. Many of them tried to pack themselves into the Vatican, and ultimately, around 300,000 of them fit within St. Peter's Square and Via della Conciliazione. Millions of others watched from video screens set up all across Rome, and calls could be heard for the Pope to immediately be given sainthood.
History tells the story of Gamal Abdel Nasser, the first president of Egypt who incited a military coup in 1952 to overthrow the European-aligned monarchy. Nasser was a highly and consistently popular politician during his 18 years in power, respected by leaders worldwide, embodying a spirit of pan-Arab unity, while also just improving the quality of life for the people he led. So when he died in 1970, the people mourned. The state had planned a relatively small ceremony in Cairo with 40 major generals and 5,000 troops. Foreign dignitaries were also supposed to arrive to take part in the service. But that didn't go to plan at all, as 5 million people arrived and flocked around the six-mile-long procession route. Mourners fought against the police, trying to break through the lines as soldiers tried to push them back with their weapons. The radio did what they could to try and talk everyone down, but the people continued to fight, wanting to take the coffin. At that point, the dignitaries were advised to leave, and it became an event more for the people, thousands of whom waited just at the end of the procession route, waving handkerchiefs to say goodbye. That said, the mourning wasn't limited to only Cairo, with many other cities around Egypt reporting incidents and similarly huge gatherings. In the 1970s, Ruhollah Khomeini completely shook up the political scene of Iran. Khomeini spoke out against the unpopular Shah, eventually convincing his followers to overthrow the government and becoming Iran's political and religious leader. Ten years of rule came to an end with his death in 1989. The media agencies reported that almost all of Tehran's six million residents were there for the funeral, along with millions more from neighboring cities, and that was after two million people had already kept a nightlong vigil. Those millions of people grieved the loss. It is also reported, that at some point during the procession, the mourners stopped the ten-hour-long procession entirely, reaching into the hearse and grabbing for Khomeini's body. They dragged it from the car and tore at the white shroud that covered him, trying to take pieces of what they saw as sacred relics. At that point, the body actually fell out of the coffin in the commotion and hit the ground. A helicopter had to be called in to retrieve the body, though even then, some people clung to the helicopter as it tried to take off. Considering the title of this video, it only seems fitting that the Guinness World Record holder for most attended funeral would be here. And that would be the 1969 funeral of C. N. Anna Durai. The first chief minister of Tamil Nadu, Anna Durai was known for his skills as an orator and as a leader of the Dravidian movement. His pragmatism kept the party alive, and he became something of a political icon. And so after his death, millions flocked to Madras, to pay their respects. And this wasn't one or two or three million. This was 15 million people all converging on a single city. The city set up special transportation and trains just to help people get there, but even that wasn't enough. Most people traveling without a ticket and hitching a ride on top of those trains. The streets were packed tight, so badly that VIPs couldn't get to the service, many other people hanging off of trees and buildings all along the 6-kilometer procession route. The funeral itself was actually really simple, only lasting about 15 minutes, but the wider effect on the city was insane. Madras just couldn't handle the influx of people, food prices skyrocketed, and hotels were completely overwhelmed. By the end, the city was, well, sort of trashed. The funerals of people with celebrity-type status is something that's kind of interesting, as they really do end up being this whole other level, above what you'd usually expect. Sometimes, they can just be spectacular in a strange way. Sometimes, opulent, extravagant and expensive. And on those thoughts, it is time to end this video. For access to more interesting content, check our channel's playlist and also subscribe to our channel for first-hand notification on newly published videos.